Are you ready to get into the Word this morning? Let's pray for just a second. Father, we're so thankful for the love of God and the presence of God that we feel in this room. Lord, now we just ask you to take this Word, Jesus calls it to shape our hearts. Lord, calls it to take root in our hearts as we study it, as we meditate on it. I pray, Jesus, that you would speak very clearly, that you would bring an encouragement to our hearts today, Lord, and that your perfect will would be done during this next few minutes. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, in the middle of worship, the Lord dropped a a verse, a passage of Scripture in my heart. And this week, I haven't been able to just get that out of my spirit. 1 Kings 18. Am I in control of this? Is it there? There we go. 1 Kings 18, 21. I'm reading from the NIV. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver? How long will you hesitate? Between two opinions, if the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Now, before we move on into the scripture this week, I want to just remind you of this passage and what's going on here. If you know the story, you know that the children of Israel have wandered away from the Lord. The children of Israel were God's chosen people. They've begun to walk in compromise. They, they have begun to, to worship other gods other than Jehovah God. They're confused. Some of the people would even worship Baal and Jehovah. There was a great deception in the land. There was a confusion in the land. And the word says that God sent a prophet by the name of Elijah, and he sent him to take word to the king of Israel, whose name was Ahab. And he said, I want you to meet me on the top of Mount Carmel, and I want you to bring your false prophets. So he brings 450 false prophets that prophesied that Baal was God. Then he brought 400 of the female deity, the Ashura, and and all of these. And then he said, and just go ahead and bring Israel. You can bring whoever wants to come. And, and, And so at the direction of the Lord, Elijah goes, and he's on top of Mount Carmel. The Baal prophets are all on top of Mount Carmel. And the the... There was a showdown that took place, only it really wasn't a showdown because the other God didn't show up. But what happened is they both set up altars. They both laid sacrifice on the altar. And Elijah went as far as saying, okay, I'm going to dig a trench around my altar, and you can pour water on it. And it said there was so much water that it filled up the trench. And what they were going to do is they were going to pray, and the God that showed up that consumed the sacrifice that was on the altar, the God that sent fire from heaven, was going to be proof that that was the real God. So that's what we have going on here. But before anything happens, before anything happens, this challenge comes, and Elijah challenges the people, and he says, choose who you're going to serve. If you notice, God didn't insist that they serve him. He gave them a choice. He always gives us a choice. The scripture says that the people said nothing. He went and he said, choose who you're going to serve. If you're going to serve God, if you're going to follow God, follow him. If you're going to follow Baal, follow him, but make a choice. Stop wavering between two opinions. Scripture says that Elijah simply said a simple prayer and the fire of God came and it consumed the offering, it consumed the altar, it consumed even the fire or the the water that was around it. And Scripture says even the dust on the ground around it, that the fire of God came and it consumed everything. The Baal God never showed up. So what this shows is that what it showed the people that once followed God is that the Lord is God. It said there was a revelation that took place and their eyes were opened again to realize this God is the real God. Like that Baal is not real. The Ashura is not real. There's no power. There's no other God besides Jehovah God. So that's where we pick up this morning. And then I want us to look at 1 Kings 18. We're going to go down to verse 41. This is immediately following what happened on top of Mount Carmel. 
Immediately following this, it says, And Elijah said to Ahab, the prophet said to the king of Israel, Go, eat and drink, for there is a sound of a heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, Mount Carmel. He bent down to the ground. He put his face between his knees. Go and look towards the sea, he told his servant. And he went up and he looked. There's nothing there, he said. Seven times Elijah said, Go back. The seventh time. The servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Now here we have Elijah. He's this chosen prophet of God. Felt like he was the only one still standing for God. He was the chosen prophet of God. He was chosen to bring reformation back to the people. Then we have Ahab, who's the king of Israel, who the scripture tells us in 1 Kings 16, 30, that King Ahab did evil in the sight of God more than any other king before him. If you notice, it says that a lot in the Old Testament. It's like each generation, each king wandered further and further, those that did not know the Lord. But it says here that King Ahab, just so you know, he, he married a woman by the name of Jezebel. She brought all these false beliefs, all these beliefs of compromise, all these things into the land of Israel, and they began to compromise. Some were compromised, and some turned completely away from the Lord. But what I want you to notice today from this passage of Scripture, that the minute that the children of God made up their mind to stop wavering and to choose who they were going to follow, the minute that they decided, I'm going to follow God, at that moment, he began to work things out for their good. Before anything happened in the natural. You can see this, but the minute that they made up their mind, he began to work. And the minute that they turned back and stepped into obedience, God began to bless. The blessing wasn't apparent yet in the, nat- in the natural, but God was moving on their behalf. Now, one thing that's important for you to know is when all this happened, they were in the middle of a three-year drought, a three-year famine. Scripture says there had not been any rain to touch the land in three years, not even the morning dew. I mean, there was nothing. The ground was parched. No clouds probably in the sky, none at least that were going to deposit rain. Scripture says that, I, that, that Elijah says, but I hear the sound of a heavy rain. He knew in his spirit that God was about to open up the heavens and pour out refreshment into their lives. Like God was about to bring blessing. He knew this in his spirit. And it was what they needed most at that time. What they needed most in their natural lives at that time. So this morning, I have a question. What would you say that you need most right now in your life? That's beyond your control, that you can't fix. What is it that you would say that you need most in your life? There's a couple of things that are very important in this passage of Scripture that we can take and we can apply apply to those areas where where, where we need the Lord. Those things that we need the most in our life. The first thing is this. If you notice, just because God had promised the rain, and just because the prophet already had this sense in his spirit that it was on his way, Elijah still had to pray. He still had to ask God to deliver on his promise. He still had to ask. He still had to pray for that to come forth. God had promised it. He had told him, if you read this passage, if you read the chapters before that, you'll see God had said, if you'll go and you'll present yourself before the king, and if you'll do these things, then I'm going to send the rain. There will no longer be a drought. There will no longer be a famine. I'm going to bring refreshment. I'm going to bring provision. I'm going to need what this land needs. It took obedience, and it took prayer to move the hand of God. The promise was there. The rain is available. But you've got to step into the obedience. You've got to do what I ask you to do for that promise to come forth. And you've got to pray. See, God had revealed it to Elijah's spirit that something was coming and that they needed to get ready before it ever arrived. But it still required Elijah's obedience. Sometimes we get stuck in a place 
and we wonder why something's not changing. And I believe it's many times because the Lord is saying, because I'm still asking you to do this. Like, there's still a step of obedience. I'm just waiting on you to step into that obedience. When you step into the obedience and with a a, a prayer of faith, it moves the hand of God. It moves the hand of God in our situation. The promises here are available. The Word of God is full of promises for us. But it takes our obedience to living up to what these promises say. And then the prayer of faith to bring those things about. James 4 even tells us, you don't have because you do not ask. Or maybe you, don't, maybe you ask, but you ask with the wrong motives. The wrong reason in your heart. The things that you need the most in your life. That thing that, that you're truly praying about in faith, his promises, all those things. God has got a promise in his word for you for that area of your life. Everything that we need, the word says, for life and for godliness is found in his word. We just have to, we have to search it out. We have to step into the obedience of what he puts in our heart, and then we have to believe by prayer and, and the prayer of faith to see it come about. The next thing that we see is is Elijah had to pray. He had to obey, and he had to pray. And then the other thing that we see is he went to a rather strange place to pray. Now, if you remember, they, they met on the top of the mountain. Scripture says God showed out mighty. And it says that the, the children of Israel... Their eyes were open to see, wow, God is, th- is God, Jehovah God. He is the real God. He is the Lord. Their eyes were open to see again. And it says that they seized all the Baal prophets, that they led them down the mountain to the brook of Kishon. And at that place, they, they slew their enemy. They killed the enemy at that place. But then... Immediately after, Elijah says, I sense in my spirit this heavy rain that is about to come. And what did he do? He went back to the top of Mount Carmel. He went back to the place where that last miracle happened. He went back to the place where God showed himself mighty. He went back to the place where the challenge had been issued. Stop wavering, stop hesitating. Stop limping. Do you know the word waver? The word hesitate means to limp in the original translation. It doesn't mean you're stuck. It means you're weak. God sent him back to the top of the mountain. Do you know sometimes when God moves miraculously in your life, it seems like immediately after that, Sometimes the storm comes, or sometimes we feel the weakest. weakest. And God wants us to go back to that place where we remember that He was the mightiest in our life. He wants us to go back to that place where we remember His power. He wants us to go back and remember the times in our life where He's come back, or He's, he's come mightily. We don't go back and remember the bad times. Philippians 3.13, Paul said, forget what lies behind. Matthew said it all through worship today. I was amazed at how God lines this stuff up. He didn't know what I was preaching about. Yes, Scripture says, forget what lies behind. Impress, strive towards what lies ahead. But it's not saying you can't look back and remember the goodness of God. It's not saying don't look back and see the provision of God. What it's saying is don't look back to the hard times. Don't look back to the things that have hurt you. Don't look back to the things that are not God. But you can look back and lock eyes with the Lord and remember His goodness and remember His provision and remember His power. It's in remembering that our faith is strengthened. It's in remembering everything that He's done for us that our faith is strengthened. So what do we need to remember today? That thing that is most important in your life right now. What is it that we need to remember about the Lord that impacts that area of your life? When the enemy comes in like a flood trying to get you to feel a certain way or to react a certain way, we have to forget those things that cause those feelings and emotions and we have to press forward towards the Lord, but we can look back and remember His goodness, His power, His provision. Look back and and, and remember the times that He strengthened you. 
Look back and remember the times that he's healed you. Look back and remember the times that he's encouraged you. Look back and remember his goodness in your life. It strengthens you. It builds your faith. Elijah, if you notice, he had to get into a posture of humility. The word said that he went to the top of the mountain and he bowed down to the earth and he put his face to his knees. It's not the position of your physical body that matters, but it is the position of your heart. There is a humility, a humility that is required to see and to live and to walk in the blessing of God. And Elijah saw this. Elijah, Elijah knew this. He bent down. He bowed down. He reverenced the Lord. He submitted to God. He also sent his servant to watch for a sign. Verse 43, go and look toward the sea. Look and see if you see the sign of a heavy rain. The servant came back and he said, there's nothing there. You know, the servant was probably like, what in the world? Like, it hasn't rained in three years. We haven't even seen wet grass in the morning. Like, what, why? But he kept saying, go back. Because he knew in his spirit God had promised blessing. Like, he knew in his spirit that God was a good God. He knew in his spirit that God had said, there's a heavy rain coming. You need to watch for it. You need to look for it. Elijah knew what he sensed in his heart. And he didn't give up, but he kept praying. He kept watching. He kept expecting. He didn't allow the, the, the lack of rain up until that point to change his expectation. He kept believing in the Word of God, in the desire of his heart. He kept believing. He kept praying. And he kept sending his servant to look. Elijah said, go. Some versions versions say, go back. Some say, go up. To go is to ascend, to climb, to move up. It means to change your perspective, to gain a different perspective. Do you know sometimes we need to gain a different perspective? We need to gain a different outlook about what is happening in our life. And the place that we find that is humbly submitted to God and in prayer. That is when He can speak to us very clearly. That's when He can allow us to see and to know that He is still in control. That it doesn't matter what it looks like in the natural. It may look like nothing is changing. But God is doing something. He's doing something. A new perspective comes from praying, from watching, from hoping in the Lord. Not based on our circumstances. In Habakkuk chapter 2, it reminds us that the righteous live by faith and not by sight. He reminds us that if, the, if God has promised you something, that it's for an appointed time. And he writes, he says, though it tarry, it will not fail. Like, though it tarry, it will come. It's all a matter of God's time. But it's also a matter of our heart. And it's also a matter of of our pursuing him. Are we walking in faith? Are we living in faith? Are Are we approaching him with a prayer of faith? That fervent prayer of a righteous person that stirs the heart of God. The fervency means passionate. Fervency means like like, uh, tenacity not to give up. Not in praying our will, but in praying His. The fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That's what the Word of God says. Not giving up. Though it delay, though it be, uh, uh, though it tarry at the appointed time, it will not fail. I thought about mom and dad this morning. While I was looking over my notes. We started this journey, for the most part, the year Matthew was graduating from high school. So years ago, 
I made you sound really old. Four or five years ago. And there were times that we thought that's about to happen. And then other times we said, well, it'll never happen. But there was something inside of our hearts that said, God, when it's your time, when it's the right time, when it's your appointed time, it will happen. And there's nothing that can stop it. And when God comes, he comes in abundance. He doesn't just come in the little things. He comes in great blessing. And when he comes, he comes suddenly. That doesn't have to mean like boom quickly, but it means when it happens, it happens. God works in miraculous ways. He works in different ways. But sometimes we give up before the miracle takes place. We give up because we're tired of fighting. We give up because we're looking at it through our natural eyes. And God is saying, I need you to get a different perspective. I need you to find me in prayer. And I need you to find me in faith. And I need you to persist because I'm working on your behalf. I work all things out for good, for His glory. We just have to trust Him. All of that comes as we spend time in His presence. All of that comes as we tarry in prayer. It says, on the seventh time, the servant came back to him. And he said, well, I see a cloud arising over the sea the size of a man's hand. Understand, remember, there's been no rain for three years. And he said, well, I think I see a cloud way out there. This small cloud the size of a man's hand compared to the sea. It was a small cloud. I think I see this small thing arising. I'm sure it didn't look like much. But Elijah knew in his spirit that it didn't matter what it looked like, that those small things sometimes can turn into the greatest blessings. The small things can sometimes turn into the miracle that we need. The small things can turn into this, just this great harvest in our lives. So Elijah tells him, go tell the king you need to prepare yourself. Because when God moves, he comes in abundance. Be prepared for what God wants to do in your life. The Lord is challenging us again this week. Stop wavering. Stop hesitating. Stop limping between two opinions. Two opinions means two divisions. It means Divided opinions, a divided heart. God is saying stop limping along and sometimes living in faith and then sometimes living in fear. Stop limping along and sometimes living in his strength, but then sometimes living in your own. Stop limping along and learn to walk by faith and not by sight. It's a learning process. We work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We learn what it means to walk by faith and by sight, and not by sight. We learn what it means to trust God as it work, even when we can't see anything happening around us. To trust that He's at work, even when the answers look so small that it seems to be hopeless. To trust that He is still working, even though nothing's changing. To trust that God is at work, even though it takes time. It takes time. Six times the servant came back and said, there's nothing happening. Six times there is nothing changing. Like I see nothing. But Elijah knew Because why? Because he was humbly praying and seeking God. And God put that in his spirit and he knew he could hold on to it. He knew he could hold on to it. And that seventh time, the answer came. And though it was small, though it was a small small thing in the natural, it was exactly what they needed and it became a powerful thing in their life. The answer came. To the prayers that, that we pray may take time. But we can't lose hope. We can't get distracted. 
They may take time, but they're being heard. And God is moving. The greatest blessings in our life sometimes arise out of small beginnings. This cloud the size of a man's hand that took some time to form because six times he said, there's nothing there. And the seventh time he saw something beginning to form. In the middle of a drought, in the middle of a famine that had not seen rain in three years, but yet this little cloud brought this great, great shower. It brought refreshing, it brought provision, and it brought the blessing that they needed. They had to keep praying. Elijah had to keep praying, keep watching, keep trusting. Zechariah 4.10 tells us, Who dares despise the day of small beginnings? Don't despise the day of small beginnings. Don't discard the small victories in your life. Don't overlook the small things that God does in your life. Keep a humble heart. Keep a thankful heart. Zechariah was a prophet that was sent by God to encourage his people to build the second temple. The first temple had been utterly destroyed. It was magnificent. The people were taken into captivity. Now they're sent back to their homeland and they've got to rebuild this temple. And Zechariah, instead of bringing this strong word of rebuke, he comes and he brings a strong reminder to the people that the future blessing is always contingent on present day obedience. If you walk in obedience today, you may not see the change immediately, but God is working if you're living in obedience because the scripture says obedience is greater to the Lord than sacrifice. That obedience is greater than sacrifice. Future blessing is always contingent on present day obedience. Zechariah, his name means God remembers. God remembers what he has written in this word to us. He remembers the covenant that he has with his people. God remembers that he's promised us life And life to the full. He remembers that he's promised us exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or imagine as we allow his power to work in us. So he says, I promise you exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or imagine in this life as long as my power is working in you and you're not doing it in your own strength. There's a there's a contingency there on that promise. God remembers the covenant of Jesus God remembers that he's called us overwhelming conquerors. But it's as we live in the perfect love of God that we get to be an overwhelming conqueror. He remembers these things. He remembers that he's promised us every spiritual blessing, the word says. Every spiritual blessing for life and godliness. God remembers this. That as we strive to live a life that's blameless, not perfect, but blameless, He says, I remember that I've promised them that blessing. I've promised them what they need. He remembers. I want to read you a a little paragraph out of a commentary that I like to use when I'm studying. It's Matthew Henry commentary. Matthew, if you want to go ahead and set up. This is Matthew Henry's words, and it says, In God's work... The day of small things is not to be despised. Though the instrument may be weak and unlikely, God often chooses such by them to bring about great things. Though the beginnings be small, God can make the latter end greatly to increase. A grain of mustard seed may become a great tree. Let not the dawning light be despised, for it will shine more and more to the perfect day. The day of small things is the day of precious things and will be the day of great things. I hope today that you are encouraged by the Lord. 
that he is working all things out for good, for his good purpose, and for his glory through your life if you love him and if you live for him. That is his promise to you. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter what it feels like. He's working on your behalf. We have to keep praying. We have to keep humbly submitting ourselves to the Lord and to others. We can't lose hope. We have to trust that in His appointed time, that it will come about. Don't lose hope. Don't give up. It takes time. Celebrate the small victories. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. Though it may not look like much and though it may tarry, God will come forth in your life. And he will bring blessing. I think about some of you and the things that you have going on that are definitely outside of your control. That are definitely beyond anything that you can fix on your own. And the Lord this morning is just saying, don't give up. Continue to pursue. Continue to humbly Serve Him. Love Him. Knowing that He is working things out. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Even when it doesn't make sense. Trust Him. When you can't see His hand at work, trust His heart is for you. The end of this passage of Scripture, verse 45 and 46 in 1 Kings 18, it says this. It says, Meanwhile, meanwhile, while Elijah was bent down to the ground, while Elijah was praying, while the servant was watching, and while Ahab was preparing, meanwhile, it says, the sky grew black with clouds, a wind arose, a heavy rain started falling, and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came upon Elijah, tucking his cloak into his belt. He ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. When, meanwhile, in a little while, while you're praying, while you're watching, while you're hoping, while you're expecting, while you're preparing for the answer, God brings it. God brings it. He brings it while you're watching and praying in faith. He brings it. Our responsibility is to follow the Scripture. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding and in all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. In all your ways recognize God. In the small things, recognize God. Recognize God. I want to ask you this morning as we close, we're going to take just a time of reflection for a couple of minutes. I'm not going to call the worship team up this morning because, you know, they also need time to let the Lord deal with their hearts, to minister to their hearts. I want to ask you again, what is it that you need most from the Lord during this time in your life? In taking that thing and then also looking back, not at the other times, but looking back at God and His goodness and His mercy and His love and His provision and His faithfulness. Lock eyes with God this morning. 
Where did he last come out powerfully for you? Where did he last show out mightily in your life? Because whatever that thing is, whatever he did for you then, he wants to do for you again. He wants to do it again. It may require time, and it will require your prayers and your expectations. But in his appointed time, it will come. We're going to take just a few minutes here. I want us just to quiet ourselves. Sometimes this makes people uncomfortable. It shouldn't make you uncomfortable. Just sit for a moment in the presence of God. And allow him to reveal his love for you. And then we'll dismiss. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Bless you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I pray that today this word, Lord, would just... uh, go deep in our hearts, Jesus, that you would encourage us, God, to remember to lock eyes with you, to guard our hearts above all else, for out of it flows all the decisions, all the, all the issues of life, God. I pray that we take every thought captive, Lord. God, as the enemy tries to bombard our minds, that we take every thought captive, Lord Jesus, and cause it to submit, O oh Lord, to the knowledge of who you are. Weigh it against your word, Lord. Weigh it against your promises, God. Lord, you are faithful to meet us right where we are. So, God, I pray that we would walk in humility, that we would ro- walk in a dependence on you every day, Lord, knowing that you never leave us, you never forsake us, that you're that friend that sticks closer than a brother, Lord. 
that though there are things in our lives that are completely out of control, Jesus, I pray that you speak a word of encouragement over every heart today, that they would know that you see them and that you are working all things out for good. And in in the appointed time, if they keep praying and they keep watching and they keep preparing their hearts, Lord, for the answer, Jesus, that you will bring forth what they need because you're a good God. God, I pray, encourage us today, Lord. Encourage us, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We love you with everything that we are, God. Amen. I want to say this as we dismiss. Guard your heart. Above all else, if you study this passage of Scripture, if you read through 1 Kings, and you'll see that there's these, these great times where the Lord shows out, and, I mean, He comes mightily and shows the people who He is. Reminding them of His, his love, His provision, His timing that is perfect. And Elijah, as strong as Elijah was, Right after this, Elijah, this man who has just prayed the rain, prayed the fire down and then prayed the rain down from heaven. God used him mightily. And then right after this, it tells you in the very next chapter, he runs and he hides and he wants to die. Why? Because he lost the, 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 the whatever he found on top of of Mount Carmel, the presence of God, locking eyes with him, remembering the provision of God, standing on the promises of God, and began to walk in his own strength, and he became defeated. The Lord's saying, don't waffle, don't waver, don't hesitate, just just stay, just stay, just stay. He's faithful to meet us there every time. Every time we go into his presence, he's faithful. He's with us. It's not like we have to go lock ourselves off in a room and be by ourselves. Yes, we need that. But what he's saying is be aware that I am with you every step of the way. I'm with you every hour of the day. I'm with you. He's an amazing God. He's an amazing God. We love you guys. We're glad that you were here We pray the blessing of God on you this week, and we pray that you'll go in peace this morning and that your hearts are encouraged. Amen. Amen. We love you.